Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see all of you here today on this beautiful, beautiful day. Before I, I jump into the message, there's just a, a, a quick little plea that I, I would like to, to make to you all real quick. There, we're, we're in the middle of a kind of a good problem right now here as a church. Um, two of the last three weeks have been two of the biggest kids ministry attendances that we have ever had like we've had well over a hundred kids uh, on Sunday mornings the the two two of the last three weeks um, and I, I know that there are certain situations that cause volunteering to be more difficult from time to time you guys know where I'm going with this um, I know that we're in the middle of flu season and all of that but but because of that we are 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 in need of of people to volunteer and. And I mean, there, there's so many stories I could tell you. There's stories of, of little kids, especially in like our two-year-old classroom. There, there's stories of little kids who are going there, and each week they don't really know who their teacher is. And you know how a two-year-old is. If they don't know who the teacher is, they're going to be a little bit more hesitant to go into the classroom, which makes it more difficult on parents and the whole thing. So we need some people who are willing to volunteer in the twos class. And then just with the flu season and everything like that, if you could volunteer just as a sub, say, you know, I don't want to be on a schedule or anything like that, but, but if you guys need somebody, I can step in week here, week there, something like that. Um, we, we, we need it, man. We are so excited about having all these kids show up, but we want to make sure like, we, we, the classes are, are bursting at the seams. And I'm guessing, I, I'm guessing that, that if you're a parent here, in some way, shape, or form, our kids' ministry has been able to bless you. And so, as a parent to a parent, can I ask you, will you bless our kids' ministry? Will you go ahead and sign up and volunteer and help us in that way? If you're interested in that, please take the Connect card from the seat back in front of you. Just write kids' ministry in the prayer request line or somewhere on there. Put your name, your contact information, and we'll reach out to you guys because we want to make sure that we're able to, to, to serve all the people that the Lord is allowing to us to steward in, in, in this time. So anyway, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for today, and thank you for this opportunity to be in this place. God, I, I love this worship set this morning, just to, to kind of strip everything back and say, we just want to come back into your presence. Nothing else matters other than spending time with you. And so, Jesus, over these next several moments, will you please communicate to our hearts clearly? Will you please allow us to, to see our hearts for what they really are? Will we... Just strip away all the pretense and all the, 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 the fakeness and all the, the stuff that we try to put out to make ourselves look better than we really are. And will you help us to be true and authentic in this place with you today? Jesus, we love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. So there's a, a pretty familiar text um, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, and, and it really just kind of explains... The difference in the way that God sees people from the way that we tend to see people. You, a little bit of background is, is, is um, Saul has been the, the, the first king of Israel, but he has been rejected by God. And, and, and because he has been rejected by God, the prophet Samuel has been tasked to go and, and, and find the new king, to anoint the new king. And so Samuel is sent to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem, and, and, and he shows up and he lets Jesse know what he's there to do, and, and all of a sudden Jesse begins to bring in his son, starting with the oldest, and man, these are, are big boys, these are strong, handsome boys, these are impressive young men. It's the kind of person that Samuel would look at and say, now this person looks kingly. But with each son that passed by, the, the Lord kept saying, nope, 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 until all the sons were gone. And so Samuel looked at Jesse and said, do, do you have another one? Like, like, is there another one hiding in a closet? Like, like, like where is, there, there, there has to be somebody else. And he says, well, well I have another son, but, but he's out in the field with the sheep. And Samuel says, well, please bring him here. And so in walks little David the youngest of the family, the runt of the family. And, and the Lord says to Samuel, this is the one that you are to anoint the new king. 
But throughout this process, as Samuel is getting caught up in just the appearance of these, these big, strong men who would make impressive kings, the, the Lord said something that has become a pretty familiar text. Maybe some of you are familiar with this in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And the interesting thing about Samuel being sent to anoint a new king is that this was never the way that it was supposed to be. When God chose the people of Israel to be his people, whenever he set them apart as his people, kind of part of the deal was that God would be their king. But after the Israelite nation was established, they began to look around at all the other nations and they noticed that all the other nations had a king and so they wanted a king, but God was their king. But since they wanted a different king, God gave them a different king. He gave them Saul. And this idea of wanting to be like everyone else has always been a subtle part of the Israelite story. They took great pride in being set apart as God's people. They took great pride in being the group of people that God would, would give his law to and that he would give the sign of his covenant to. But by Paul's day in the book of Romans, they were putting far too much trust in it. Their focus had become more outward than inward. They had focused more on behavior than transformation. Their focus had become more on religious heritage than the heart. But the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. Over the past few weeks, we've been working our way through kind of this opening of Paul's letter to the Romans and and, and, and we've seen as he talks to this very diverse church, this church that is full of Jews and Gentiles, that, that Paul wants to do a couple of things really, really well. And he wants to make sure that he's communicating a couple of things really, really clearly. One, he wants to make sure that everyone understands that, that they need the gospel. But just to make sure that's good and, and, and all, he wants to make sure that everyone clearly, clearly sees their need for the gospel. If you remember in the middle of chapter 1, around verse 16, Paul makes this incredible, this incredible proclamation. He says that he is not ashamed of the gospel. But as soon as those words come flowing out of Paul's heart, he changes direction and he changes his tone and he, he goes in, in a completely new way. And he, he essentially says that there are two groups of people at play here. There are two groups of people that, that exist in our world. You, you have the unrighteous, who in Paul's context would have been the Gentiles, those who were outside of the church. But then you have the self-righteous, who in Paul's context would have been the Jewish people. It would have been the religious people. And toward the end of chapter 1, Paul focuses on the thems and the theys, the, all of those who are outside of the church, on all of those who are unrighteous. And he says things like this, that, that, that they suppress the truth, that they are idolaters, that they are sexually immoral, that they have a depraved mind, and that they are full of every kind of wickedness, that they are full of envy and deceit, that they are, are gossips and God-haters, that they are arrogant and boastful, that they invent ways of doing evil, that they disobey their parents. And not only do they do these things, but they are proud of it. And then in chapter 2, just as Paul's religious audience is probably starting to feel kind of good about themselves as they just heard Paul go on this rant towards all of the thems and the theys and those who are not religious and those who are not in the church, Paul turns his attention on, on those who are inside of the church. And he says that, that you... You religious people, that you judge others, but, but when you judge others, you actually do the same things. And so whenever you're judging others, you're actually condemning yourselves. He says that, that you, you religious people, your, your hearts are hard, that they are stubborn, that they are unrepentant, that, that you religious people, you are actually frustrated with God's patience, His forbearance, and His kindness. And as chapter 2 continues, Paul keeps going in this same general direction, talking to, 
to you, to us, to the religious people, except now his warning, is in the improper places that religious people put their hope. And so this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 17. And remember, the Jews, the, the, the religious people, they, they take great pride in receiving the law, and they take great pride in the sign of the covenant. We'll get into that here in just a moment. This is what he says in verse 17. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, in other words, if you know what is right and if you approve of what is right, we're all tracking in a good direction here so far. If you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light to those who are in the dark, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, so you know what is right, you approve of what is right, and you want others to know and to follow what is right. What could be wrong, right? I mean, we're, we're going in a really good direction. He says in verse 21, here we go. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You preach against stealing, but do you steal? You, you who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles. God's name is blasphemed among those who are unrighteous. God's name is blasphemed among those who are outside of the church because of you. There it is. You know what's right. You approve of what's right. You want others to know and follow what's right, but you just don't do what is right. You have the law, but in many ways you were just like everyone else. You have the truth, but in many ways you were just like everyone else. You are putting your confidence in something that you don't follow. Knowing what's right and doing what's right and practicing what's right are very different things. And I know that, that as long as we are on this side of eternity, as long as we are in this process of, of sanctification, as long as we are continuing to be made into the likeness of Jesus, we will continue to have sin struggles in this world. And so it's not that Paul you know, is getting onto them because of the sin struggle, and, and, and it's not even that Paul is getting onto them because they are talking about the sin struggle that they, that, that, that they may have. We will continue to do that pretty much every single week that I stand on this stage and I talk to you all. I can promise you that I am, I am talking to you all about things that I, I oftentimes probably struggle with myself, but the thing that Paul is trying to say, the thing that we have to understand is that it's not that you have sin struggles, it's not that you talk about sin struggles. It's that you talk about sin struggles while trying to act as though you don't struggle. That's where the problem comes. That's where the hypocrisy comes from. And as much as this is an indictment on Paul's Jewish audience, his religious audience, it is equally an indictment on us. But now Paul, he moves from, from, from knowing and not doing to shining a light on how they have placed improper confidence in the sign of the covenant. What is that? Circumcision. Yep. The sign of the covenant. Going all the way back to Father Abraham, who had many sons, and to all the many sons who had Father Abraham, this is a sign that God gave to his people that to, to, to physically show that they belong to him. He says, circumcision has has value if you observe the law, if you keep the 613 laws and commandments in the Mosaic law. But if you break the law, you become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision are a lawbreaker. How many of you, whenever you woke up this morning, thought you'd hear the word circumcision this much today? Anybody woke up just looking forward to it? <clears throat> a person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely an outward and physical, but here it is, no, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. 
And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We can put our, our hope in so many different places. And, and honestly, so many of the places that we tend to put our hope are based on the outward appearance. They are based on the things that we can see and the things that we can measure. But there is only one place that our hope really belongs. And it goes back to what Paul was talking about in chapter 1. It goes all the way back to our hope belongs in the gospel. Our hope belongs in the good news of Jesus Christ. And so as Paul is, is writing and, and warning his audience that they are putting their hope in improper places, what I want to do is I want to look at, for, for pretty much the rest of our time, I want to just look at three places where, where Paul is saying, do not put your hope here. The first one is this. Don't put your hope in your religious background. Don't put your hope in your religious background. Be thankful for it. But don't put your hope in it. It's a beautiful gift, a religious heritage from your family, until you put your hope in it. It's a beautiful gift and until you believe that your religious heritage grants you a right standing before God. Parents and grandparents who, who love the Lord and who teach their family about the goodness of Jesus is one of the most precious gifts that a child could ever receive. Being raised in the church and being taught how to pray, being taught how to study scripture. Again, it is a beautiful gift, but none of these things mean anything if you don't make your faith your own. Your parents' faith will not get you a right standing before Jesus on judgment day. Your grandparents' Bible will not get you a right standing before Jesus on judgment day. And so let me ask you a couple of questions, and I hope that you can really just try and look internally whenever, whenever I ask you these questions, but, but I, I, I'm just curious, when, when was the last time, when was the last time that you really prayed on your own? Not at dinner time, not, you know, just at bed, you know, that, that Jesus, thank you for today kind of thing. And it's not that there's anything wrong with those prayers at all. But, but when was the last time that you really, really prayed? You stopped everything and you just acknowledged the presence of God around you. When was the last time that you really, really prayed on your own? When was the last time that, that you really had a hunger to study scripture on your own? Not because you were just going through a Bible study, but basically you woke up and it's like, I cannot make it another minute without opening up the Word of God. When was the last time that you experienced something like that on your own? When was the last time that you worshipped on your own? Maybe it's through singing. Maybe it's through just sitting and, and quiet. Maybe it's through right, taking out a piece of paper and just starting to jot down your thoughts. Maybe it's, it's just taking a ride in the car in the countryside and listening to praise and worship music. When was the last time that, that, that you just stopped and you, you, you just basked in the presence of God and you allowed his presence to just kind of wash over you on your own? Your faith must be your faith. The gift of faith from a family, again, it is a, a beautiful gift, but, but a relationship with Jesus has to be your decision. Probably one of the most common questions that we get asked around here, maybe that's a little bit of hyperbole, but we get asked it a lot. One of the questions that we get asked a lot around here, probably should have just said that from the beginning, it, it, it goes something like, like, like this. So, so I was baptized as a baby, or, or I was baptized whenever I was really young. Normally it starts off something like that. I was baptized whenever I was really young, but whenever I look back on it, I don't think that I was baptized because I wanted to be baptized. I think that I was baptized because, because my parents wanted me to be baptized. I think I was baptized because I saw all of my friends getting baptized. I, you know, I, I, I was baptized because I wanted to be the youngest person in my family who was baptized. You know, you have all these reasons, and, but, 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 but it wasn't really because you had made a decision. And so the question is, 
that we get asked often is, do, so do I need to be baptized again? And this is such an important question because the same way that circumcision was the sign of the covenant in the old, or the, for, for the old covenant, baptism and the Lord's Supper are the sign of the covenant in the new covenant. And so if you've ever asked those questions, if I could just for a moment try and encourage you, can, 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 can I encourage you at least to make sure that the decision that you have made has been your decision? Can I encourage you to personalize that decision, to internalize that decision? Can I encourage you to make it your decision and I hope that you hear this because I'm not saying that, that, that the way you were raised was wrong. Be so incredibly thankful for the family that you've had. Be so incredibly thankful for the way that you were raised, for the things that have been passed down to you. But I just want you to make sure that your faith is your own. And we're going to get into this a little bit more here in a couple of months because Paul in Romans chapter 6, he just dives straight into baptism. And, and so we will dive into baptism whenever we get to Romans chapter 6. And in fact, the first Sunday of May, we're going to have a baptism Sunday as we talk about what Paul talks about with baptism. And so over these next couple of months, can I just encourage you, can I ask you, will you ask yourself those questions? Is my faith my own? Have I put my faith in Jesus, personally, on my own. The second thing where Paul would say don't put your hope is don't put your hope in what others can see. Just because you look good on the outside doesn't mean that things are good on the inside. It means that maybe we are really good at modifying our behavior. It means that maybe we, we are really good at putting filters over our heart to where, where it catches all the messed up stuff that's coming out of our heart before it makes its way out of our mouth or out of our actions. We can fool a lot of people for a really long time, but God does not look at the things that people look at. We look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. As you go throughout Jesus' ministry, there's this one group of people that, that he probably had more attention with than, than any other group of people, and they were a group of people that they looked so, so good on the outside. I mean, they were some of the most moral people to ever walk on this planet. They took the 613 laws in the law of Moses and said, yeah, that's, that's nice, Moses, but that's not good enough. We need a little bit more here. And so we're going to take this law and we're going to add more laws to it so that way we can have guardrails to make sure that we're not getting anywhere near breaking the law. It was a group who were known as the Pharisees. And I know in the church, the Pharisees get such a bad reputation but whenever you look at the Pharisees, they were a moral, moral group of people. And there were some who did a lot of good things in their morality. You have people like Nicodemus. And you have Paul who, who continued to, to claim to be a Pharisee even after he, he followed Jesus. You, 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 you have this, but, but many of these religious and moral leaders were the people that Jesus saved his harshest rebukes for. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus He's talking to some of these religious leaders, and he gives them these seven woes, like these woe to yous, and I just want to read a few of them to you. He says, woe to you, you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are, woe, woe to you, you teachers of law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the dish, you make sure that you look good on the outside, but the inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence, you blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the dish, and then the outside will also be clean, woe to you, you teachers of law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs, which are beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you are full of, of bones of the dead and everything unclean, in the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy. In wickedness, in, in chapter three, 23, verse 5, he says this about them. He says, everything that they do is done for people to see. And whenever he's talking to the crowd around them, this is what he says about the Pharisees. He says, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do. 
for they do not practice what they preach. Some of Jesus' harshest words were, were reserved for those who wanted to look better than they really were. And then it's a warning that has to be passed along to us as well today. But whenever you look at this warning, this, is, the, 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 this warning sign is actually just like one of the most beautiful pictures of, of a way that Jesus cares and loves for us. Because not only does our hypocrisy damage our witness to the world, to, to, to the unrighteous in Paul's context, not only does our hypocrisy damage those relationships, but, but our hypocrisy damages us. Hypocrisy is exhausting. Trying to put on some sort of face and be portrayed as something you're not is exhausting and it's pointless. And it hardens your heart and it takes you so far away from the life that Jesus desires for you to live. And so Jesus warns us instead of spending our time trying to look better than we really are on the outside, instead he invites us to be authentic and to spend more time with him and to allow his spirit to transform us on the inside. The third place that Paul says don't put your hope is very simply don't put your hope in your theological knowledge. Don't confuse knowing about with knowing. There's a very real difference in knowledge and intimacy. I can tell you all about Patrick Mahomes, but I do not know Patrick Mahomes. There's a very real difference in knowing about and knowing. And again, Jesus, he hit on this during the Sermon on the Mount with these eye-opening words. We've read these here before, and I never really loved reading them. But man, they are so, so powerful. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then Jesus says, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so this is what Paul is communicating to these Roman Christians. Yes, some of you, you, you know the law. You know what's right and you know what's wrong. You've been raised to know about God's character and his purpose. And that's great. That's a beautiful gift. But don't you dare think that that means you are superior to those who didn't have those things. For us... Some of you were raised going to church, to youth group, to VBS or Awanas. You've been to CIY and you've made decisions at church camp. And that's beautiful. But don't you dare put your hope in that. And don't let, you, and don't let it convince you that you're superior to those who didn't do those things. Some of you have had WWJD bracelets and you wear Jesus-themed clothing some of you went to Bible studies in front of your friends at school or put spiritual bumper stickers on your car. And that's great. But don't put your hope in it. And don't let it convince you that you're superior to those who don't do those things. Some of you can recite all 66 books of the Bible. You have done Bible drills. You go to multiple Bible studies a week. You rarely miss a Sunday. You tithe. You volunteer. And we appreciate it. But don't put your hope in it. And don't let it convince you that you're superior to those who don't do those things. Tradition without transformation is pointless. Moral behavior without a transformed heart is pointless. Knowledge without application is pointless. Religion without a relationship is pointless. External acts of righteousness do not equal internal transformation. Until we allow the Holy Spirit to transform our hearts, we will never experience the life that Jesus desires for us to live or the freedom that he desires for us to experience. This is what Paul says to this Gentile church in Galatia. They had a bunch of people who were trying to force them to, to begin to follow the law, to, to essentially make themselves Jewish. And this is what Paul tells them. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. 
So stand firm then and do not let ourselves let, let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Jesus has already freed you. Don't put the yoke of slavery back on you whenever it's been done away with. But mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that, it, that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace, for though through, for through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. In verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. In other words... All of those things that you're doing to try and earn God's approval, they hold zero value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts is, is the Holy Spirit working within us to transform our hearts. Because remember, the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so I want to encourage you all to do something today. If you grabbed a bulletin or if you have your phone, open up your notes app and somewhere on something, I want you to write down this question. When God looks at your heart, what does he see? Somewhere, write it down. When God looks at your heart, what does he see? And over the course of this week, I want you to spend some time thinking about that question, pondering on that question. When God looks at your heart, what does he see? Does he see someone who is more focused with how they're portrayed by people or, or more focused on what he's actually doing inside? Does he see somebody who, who is struggling desperately with a certain kind of sin, but but trying to act like that they have it all together. When the Lord looks at your heart, what does he see? I want you to write it down. I want you to then confess it to God and to repent of it before God. Then I would love to encourage you to do something really hard. We're told that, that whenever we confess our sins to one another, that that just something beautiful kind of takes place. And so I want you to find somebody in your life that you trust, somebody that you share faith with, that, that you can confess to them what the Lord sees whenever he looks in your heart. And I want you to know, I know for the last several weeks, Paul's kind of been beating us up just a little bit. I want you to know that the good news is coming. The good news is coming. And where we are today is not the place where God intends to leave us. So will you pray with me this morning? Father in heaven, I thank you for today and for the opportunity to be in this place and hopefully to be challenged by your word. And Father, I pray that that you will help us. I, I, I know, I, I know, <laughs> I know that sometimes the hardest hearts to convict are the self-righteous hearts that don't think they need to be convicted. And so, Father, if we have walls that are around our hearts today, will you break them down, please? And will you help us to see you? Will you help us to truly acknowledge who we are before you, that our hope is found in you and you alone. Jesus, we love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Right now we're going to move into our time of invitation and over the course of this next song,